the counselor that helped me discover the sort of therapy through photography was amazing. Um, you know, I mean, I didn't tell, I liked her and we had a good relationship, but it was very much, there, there was like a distance between us that I never went into. I never filled the space that allowed her to sort of explore more. I was very guarded until she said to me, talk to me about this picture. And then I didn't f sort of go into the space. I filled the space. And she said, you know, that's the first time you've ever told me the truth. Hello, I'm Dr. Sherry Jacobson, and this is Therapy Lab, a podcast dedicated to therapy, thought, and the subtle art of mental well-being. Having been on both sides of the therapist's chair, I am interested to uncover people's personal experiences and insights about mental health, well-being, and therapy. In this episode, we are joined by Paul Sanders, former picture editor at The Times, who is an official Fuji photographer and runs courses on mindfulness and photography. Paul's is a really interesting story, and I'm excited to meet him and find out more about his life and his work. So, Paul, welcome. Thank you, Sherry. It's nice to be here. Very nice to have you here. Let's get started with a quick well-being check, if you can. How are you feeling today on a scale of 1 to 10? 10 being good or? 1 being the worst. 1 being the worst. Mm. Probably about a 6 today. 6? Yeah. Okay. So, not too bad. And is that something you check in with yourself from time to time? Um, yeah, although I don't do it on a sort of scale of 1 to 10 anymore. I, I, I don't do the sort of self-judgment in that way I just I keep little notes I keep a journal um, on a daily basis and in that I just keep my my, my thoughts about the day the, the 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 good things and the things that perhaps I could have altered um, or done slightly differently or made myself feel better in in either doing or not doing hmm. okay more descriptive um so tell us a little bit about your work if you can um I'm a professional photographer um, and uh, I've been a photographer since I was professional photographer since I was 18. Always wanted to to be a photographer. Um, I've worked in um, newspapers, in magazines, and now I do one-to-one -one workshops and group workshops, uh, as well as shooting pictures that are purely for myself. I don't take commercial sort of work. I don't do PR work or journalistic work anymore. I just shoot pictures for me. And what led you to, 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 to become interested in photography from a, from a young age? Do you remember what, um, what sparked it? Yeah, if I, going on, it was because a friend of mine got a camera. Um, and then my dad bought a camera and um, him and my mum, they, they argued for a couple of weeks over the purchase of this camera because it, although in real terms it wasn't a lot of money, at that point in time it was. Um, and the camera didn't always come out very often. I mean, he bought the magazines, but the camera stayed in the cupboard. So when they went out on a Saturday morning to the supermarket, I would go upstairs, get his camera out, take his film out, wind it back, and then put a black and white film in and just run around the garden taking pictures until I heard the car come back and then put his film back in and wind it onto the frame that I remembered was the number and then take my film away and get it processed at, at school. And I really enjoyed it. It was just, it was so magical going into a dark room and seeing something that you you observed in the garden and then producing it and you're looking at it appear in a developing tray. I mean, now it's much more instant, of course, um, but there was like a magic to it. And I fell in love with the, the magic and the kind of the romance of the whole thing. Plus, I thought it'd be a really cool job. Um, I had in the vision, in my head, I had a vision of it being really glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like every job, you know, they're all, they're only as glamorous as you make them. Um, but it was, you know, it, it, my careers advisor at school told me not to go into it. Um, it was too competitive for me. I wasn't that good at uh, chemistry or physics and therefore wouldn't understand the, the way light worked and wouldn't understand the chemistry. Well, I can't remember the last time I actually mixed chemicals. And as for light, it kind of does its own thing anyway. So, um, and then... I had a little spell doing fashion advertising work and then ended up in newspapers, working for a local newspaper, started in 1991 
a weekly newspaper in Northamptonshire, and then worked my way through regional press agencies, um, the Manchester Evening News, and then on to Reuters, the International Wire Service, before joining the Times in 2002. Um, and, you know, photography has been really good for me. I always wanted to work at the Times. There was no other newspaper for me. Um, and when I got to the Times, the only job I wanted at the Times was to be picture editor, um, because that for me was, you know, it was like being star striker of your favourite football team. You, know, you reach the top of your career, and and I thought, well, this is this is great. And then in two thousand and four, um, after helping with the the redesign that took the Times from the broadsheet to the compact format, I was made picture editor, um, and that was a pretty good job. You know, I mean, really, really enjoyed the privilege of working with some great photographers and a really good team and putting a newspaper together that I was proud of. Um, the the stress was was quite something. Um, the hours were were something else. And you, the nice thing was that if something had gone, if you had had a bit of a bad day, you always get a new start with a newspaper. Um, and it was always moving forward, uh, you know. But eventually, it started to the stress started to to wear me down. I was doing more hours in the office, less hours at home, um, and I revisited uh, sort of trying to offset the stress. Um, I became obsessive about cycling um, to relieve the stress. I'd cycle from my home in Seven Oaks to London every day um, to to beat the stress. You know, and I'm sitting there every day looking at sort of around about 20,000 pictures, trying to find one picture, and the amount of judgment that's poured on you, you know, is quite incredible. Um, and I've always had, I've always suffered with um, like imposter syndrome. You know, I think a lot of people do, you sit there, you get a job that you really want, and then you instantly think, God, do I deserve this? And you come up with a million reasons why you don't. And then you work harder to cover up your own insecurities. Um, and by working harder, you set a precedent because you then can't step back because people notice when you step back. They never notice when you step up. They never notice when you're, you know, when you're playing a really good game. They only notice when you're playing a bad game. Um, and you know, as a result, my, my marriage suffered. Um, my own health suffered, although I was very fit from the cycling. I, um, when I was a bit younger, I used to struggle with um, sort of body image. So I started um, then obsessing about my weight um, again. And then from that, the sort of frustration that I began to feel inside because my marriage was going a bit pear-shaped as well, um, led me to uh, self-harming again. And then to too much drinking. Um, and, you know, one thing led to another. And by... 2011, I had a nervous breakdown. Um, and during some time off, I realized that I'd worked so hard and so, uh, in a way, very ruthlessly to get to where I wanted and uh, to get the job that I wanted, or, you, know, uh, you know, at the cost of everything else. And when I got this job, which was a, a brilliant job, but it, it was like, well, I'm at the top of the mountain. I've stuck my flag in the snow. Now what? Can I do this from now until the day I retire? Do I want to do this from now until the day I retire? And honestly, the, the answer was straight back, no, I don't. I don't enjoy it. I don't particularly enjoy some of the people that I'm working with. I don't like what we produce anymore. Um, and I just wanted to leave. So I looked at my options and decided that I would leave. And at the end of 2011, exactly at the end of 2011, just before midnight on December the 31st, I walked out. And I have to say, I never looked back. I don't regret the way it went, although it cost me dearly, because you always learn from your experiences. Um, it would have been nice had it not cost me my marriage and things like that. but. In some ways, that would probably have, have gone slightly pear-shaped anyway. Um, you know, but it's, it's good now. I get more time with my son, um, which is important. Um, and 
I've come a long way um, since leaving there. You know, I mean, I sort of when I when I left, I thought, what am I going to do? I still want to be a photographer, and I'll become a landscape photographer, having never really taken landscape pictures before in my life, not knowing anything about the industry, um, and realized very quickly that I wasn't enjoying it. Um, I mean, in my first year after leaving The Times, I drove nearly 50,000 miles around the UK in my Mini, going to locations that other people had been to, photographing them nowhere near as beautifully as other people had. And none of it was ticking any boxes for me. It wasn't, um, it was just like collecting stamps. Mm -hmm. um, and I would go to places and there'd be a line of photographers waiting to take the same picture of a mountain that I was going to take. And there was nothing of me in there. And at the same time, I was having um, some quite intensive therapy sessions. I was going, you know, once a week or you know, once a fortnight when I was away. Um, and the, those sessions weren't doing anything. Um, I would tell the therapist what I thought she wanted to hear rather than what was actually wrong. Um, like most men, I don't do touchy-feely. Um, I do more touchy-feely now. But I found it very hard to talk about my feelings, my emotions and what was going on inside me and what I really felt. And all the time I was just this kind of boiling mass of uncertainty and noise and confusion and isolation. Um, and I could sit and opposite her and she would be talking to me and I could see her mouth going. And I couldn't hear a word she was saying. Um, and my head was just like firing stories and things into it. And I, I could hear all this going on. Um, and it just, you know, it, it just didn't really work. I mean, I went through, I don't know, four or five therapists mm -hmm. um, before I found one that I really did connect with. Um, and she eventually got me to sort of slowly open up, but she got me to open up through my pictures, um, which was quite interesting mm -hmm. because I had never at that point really considered them as a personal expression. They were always a picture of something. And I'd been doing pictures of things and then I'd, I'd go out for a walk and take a picture, but it was much more expressive in some ways than the work I was doing that I thought would be um, saleable. Uh, and she got me to talk about my feelings through my photography rather than, you know, just say, OK, this is a pretty picture of a mountain. You know, what were you thinking when you took the picture? Why did you take it like this? Why does it look like that? You know, um, and that just started me freeing myself up to, to be a bit more, a little bit more open about how I was feeling. Um, I, you know, I did uh, midway to, what was it, 2013, I did try and take my own life. Um, you know, when you kind of look back at everything, you know, having given up on a six-figure salary job, um, you lost a marriage, you know, your relationship with your son is a little bit off. I thought it was a disappointment to my parents. I thought I failed as a photographer, failed as a landscape, you know, everything was fail, 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 fail. Um, so I took myself off up to Beachy Head in Sussex, um, determined not to go home. And then... Um, for one reason or another, uh, you know, backed out, um, and you know, there's a there's a guy up there who came to talk to me, and he sort of sat down next to me, and I literally unloaded on him, um, and he pointed out to me, he said, you know, when was the last time you did something for you? And I said, well, I don't, you know, I'm I do this, I do that. And he said, yeah, but if you if you're not making it any time, you're not looking after you, how can you look after anybody else? And I, I just got to thinking that maybe there was more in that. Um, so over the next kind of 18 months, I started to make time for me. I stopped doing commercial photography um, completely. Um, so effectively, I had no income. Um, and contrary to popular belief, professional photographers, well, certainly the ones I know, aren't loaded. I haven't got a bank account full of full of money, um, but I decided that as long as I could get enough money through the door each month to cover the mortgage and the bills, 
um, that would be fine. I downsized since my wife left. Um, you know, I'd gone from a, a really big house in Seven Oaks down to a little flat um, with a small mortgage. So I, I kept all my bills low and I started right back at the beginning. You know, like what is important? This is important. This is important. This is important. That's not. And just effectively decluttering. Um, got rid of lots of actual clutter and lots of mental clutter over a, a period of time that allowed me to sort of almost take a step back, um, which was the best thing I ever did because as soon as you step back from the problem, you have the breathing space that you need. Um, and it was in, in that, gaining that breathing space that all of a sudden I realized that the pictures I take, they're purely for me. I don't care whether anybody else likes them or not because they're not for other people. Um, if people buy them, that's a bonus. Um, and the, the expression that comes out of them is, is a natural expression. It's not a contrived, oh, I'm gonna take a picture of this and make it look like that. It's a, it's a me having a, effectively a conversation, if you like, with whatever I'm photographing. Um, so whether it's a landscape or a flower, I'll just spend time um, and breathe. And then you start to, your eyes start to open up to what's around you because we live life in a tunnel. I mean, at the times I was like that, focused just on the times, just on the deadline. And we were always going somewhere at a million miles an hour with loads of information piled in and you never, you could never go. <sighs> but now my whole life is, is that deep breath. Um, and I, you know, I've changed the way I, I look at life and my priorities. Um, there, it's, it's a little bit like turning a super tank around though. You can't just go, right, I'm gonna do this because your life falls to pieces because it's a little bit like skidding into a wall if you do it really slowly, then you're able to put the building blocks in place to make the turn, if you like. Um, and it's not something I've done on my own. I've done it, you know, with the support of family and friends, um, and you know, a couple of good therapists um, and people who are sort of willing to listen. Um, you know, when you start talking about photography, normally people talk about kit. It's always about the camera. Oh, you've got a great camera. You must be a good photographer. And it's like, well, it's got nothing to do with the camera. It's about what happens up here and what happens in here. Um, and, you know, there are numerous quotes uh, from photographers that say that a photograph is, is the full expression of how you feel about life um, in the same way that painting can be very expressive as well because you can put a lot into yourself but if you get lost in the in the kit and the competitions and the Facebook likes and the Instagram popularity which is what the industry as a whole demands you know the first question a lot of people ask if you go and say well could you help me with this project the first thing how many Instagram followers do you have how many Facebook followers do you have you know what's your reach I'm like I don't know about this um, and all that to me is irrelevant um, and, and it sounds strange to say that it's irrelevant because it sounds like you're being really arrogant, but it's, it's actually very freeing because as soon as you stop worrying about what other people think of your work and of you as a person and worry about what you think of you, there's a sort of, I think there's a sort of self-healing mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. snowball that starts when it's like, well, I like that. That's okay. That's good enough for me. It's not perfect. I don't strive for perfection. I don't want perfection. I look in the mirror every morning and I don't see perfection looking back at me. <laughs> did, did you once did you once look at things in that in that yeah. lens? Yeah, absolutely. I everything had to be perfect. Um, it had to be the very best it could be. Um, second best was never an option. Um, and I I would beat myself up hugely if things weren't absolutely perfect. Um, you know, and now I'm not as bad. Mm. Sometimes I, I am, but then the, the, I, I get to a point where I go, do you know what, actually, those little imperfections, they make it more beautiful. 
Um, and I think if more of us embraced our little imperfections, the world would be a lot happier. And was the transition from perfectionism to being, being more kind on yourself a gradual one? And yes. could you pinpoint any, any sources of it? Or um, was it hard work? It was a natural um, thing, really, because I'm not a technical person. I'm not a technical photographer. And photography can be very technical. Um, and I just wanted to create pictures that I sort of enjoyed making and had fun making. Um, and I think the, the turning point, if you like, was when I went to the, uh, the lingerie store in Seven Oaks. Um, and you bear with me, it's not going weird, I promise. <laughs> and I bought some silk stockings, um, not for myself, but for my camera. And if you put a silk stocking over the lens, it softens off the image and it breaks it up a little bit. And I quite like the, 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 the paintings that Turner did where they're, you know, you know what they are, but there's a, a kind of a, a different sort of quality mm -hmm. to the light and to the way he renders the paint. And I thought if I can get a little bit of that into my, into my work, and I was shooting colour at the time. So I started in that and other photographers would have, go, have goes at me and really kind of make fun of me because I'd got my stocking filled. And they go, oh, you know, not fishnets today. And it's like, well, you know, and it, it's fun for a while. But then I just thought the only reason they have a problem with it is because actually they have a problem. That problem isn't mine. And, and at that point, that was where I realized really that the, the, the problem was other people's. I had my own stuff to deal with and sort out. What they thought of my work and the way I took pictures was irrelevant. You know, it's such a, a first world problem, if you like, what somebody thinks to your pictures. Um, and that was like taking, it just took the brakes off. And then I was able to just sort of literally just roll with it and let, let my kind of expression come out um, and enjoy it. And actually it became really good fun. Uh, I don't shoot with my stocking filter anymore. Um, you know, it got a bit laddered. Um, as they happen to. <laughs> but it was a really nice way of playing. Um, and actually, I think play is great therapy. Um, you know, and I, I'm one of those people who thinks that we should colour outside the lines, not inside the lines. Um, and if you can do that with your, you know, with your photography or with your art, however you do it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to show anybody how wildly outside the lines you went, or that you, you know, you put two clashing colours together, or you photograph something that doesn't conform to the right rules that the magazines set down. Um, you know, you've got to be yourself. You've got to be happy in your own skin. And it seems like you've really navigated your way out of some, emo you know, severe emotional distress, and. Um, I wonder if, if, you, if you view that as very situational specific, so it was mostly around your, your workload, or, or were there signs of it earlier? And if you can talk a little bit about your earlier experiences growing up um, and how, how yeah. you felt at that time. I think, I mean, from a, from a, a young child, I've, I mean, I've, I was very lucky. My parents are still together, um, and they were very supportive. Um, uh, but school was, a, was difficult. I was bullied throughout school. Um, and then I had experiences with a couple, of, a couple of teachers who were constantly on at me about not being good enough. I was terrible at maths. I couldn't write very well. Um, and you know, the, the judgment that's put down on you from quite a young age, I, I think now, looking back on it, I think now is why I was trying to be, trying to prove to myself that I was good enough. And I've always felt I've had to prove myself. Um, and I think in one conversation with my mum, actually not too long ago, I said, I've always been trying to make you and dad proud of me. And she said, but you know, we are proud of you. And I said, yeah, but we, we never really talk about it. And she said, it doesn't matter whether you're a photographer or a bin man, you know, we would be proud of you. Um, and knowing that really helps, but it, it was the, the, the judgment and the bullying through school was a real, was a real issue. Um, 
and even when I went briefly to college after school, there was, you know, there was a, uh, one of the lecturers at college was, he was just awful um, because you didn't fit into the right mold. There was, there was a lot of um, hurling of abuse and, you know, mainly verbal. Um, but you don't need that. You, you kind of want support and encouragement. You don't want hammering into a particular shape, especially when you're, you know, still trying to learn to express yourself. And I think that has had a, a huge effect on me now. Um, but I think it's only now, you know, I'm, I'm 50. You know, I think when you're kind of seven, eight, nine, you don't know these things, you're just being bullied. Um, and it's only with the sort of age, I suppose, you're able to look back and think, okay, yeah, I can see how that can knock on and, and, and build this in. Um, but I, I wasn't really aware of it. Um, Were you aware of any sense of depression at a younger age? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was, uh, what, 14, 15, I, I did start self-harming. Um, not hugely. It was mainly out of a frustration. Um, and, I mean, I didn't go to the very extreme. Um, but I would, you know, sort of cut myself regularly just to let out whatever I couldn't let out. Because um, I'm not a violent person, you know, when people had a go at me, I, I'm not the kind of person that fights back. Um, and it, it sort of, it made me question a lot why I was around, why I was there, if this was my lot. Um, and so when, you know, having, having been successful, it, it, it's sort of now I, I kind of think I didn't deserve all that. But actually, in spite of that, I still did okay. Um, but had it not been for that, had I not been um, bullied and what have you when I was younger, would I still have achieved? So if I hadn't, mm -hmm. I don't know what I'd have been, what I've done. Um, and that, so in some ways, is it a good thing? I don't know. <laughs> it does beg the question, doesn't yeah, it? Um, yeah. I, you know, I think, personally think bullying is wrong and, and awful. Um, but had it not been for some of that, I guess I wouldn't have got where I, where I am. The whole question of whether hardships make us stronger yeah. in character yeah. and more in some ways more resilient or, mm. or thirsty f to, to, to change yeah. in some way. Um, you, were, you were mentioning a breakdown. Can yeah. you describe what that was like and was it a, a, a specific episode or was it protracted and, and more um, extended? I think I knew it was coming, um, but I tried to hide it. I mean, I worked with a very close team, so I didn't want them and to think that I was kind of mentally falling to bits. Um, but I noticed it was coming because I stopped being able to sort of concentrate at all. And my temper, which is I'm normally like Mr. Patient, I have patience rolling out of me, um, and I lost all all patience, and and I wasn't I mean I wasn't sleeping at all, you know I mean I was surviving on two to three hours a night, um, and I felt like I was going completely mad, and then one day I came to work and I got the Times used to be in St Catherine's Dock, and you had to walk past a Starbucks to get there. Um, and I got as far as the Starbucks and I just had to sit down. I just couldn't, I literally physically could not take another step. Um, and it was like somebody just put a wall in front of me. And then the wheels properly sort of came off. I was, I was, in, I was in tears, I was breathless. It felt like um, my chest was being squeezed, uh, my head was being squeezed. Um, and I managed to get a message to a friend who came and got me, um, and then I was I was sent I was sent home, um, and because I'd got no outlet at home because my marriage was in a bad place, I had nowhere to go with it. So because normally if you're having a bad time at work, you can go home and you can say to your partner, "I'm having a really bad time," and they go, "Oh yeah, I'll give you a hug." Um, whereas I was going home and 
we would sit at opposite ends of the sofa and not talk. Um, we never argued, but we didn't talk. So I'd got no way of kind of working through it. Um, and and that's where it sort of, because I'd got no vent, um, you know, I, I was just constantly, it was like the drip, 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 drip. And then at some point the bath is going to overflow, isn't it? And that's what happened. Um, and the two to three hours of sleep a night, was that because the volume of work was so much or was it that you were finding it difficult to get I, to sleep? I would find it very hard to go to sleep. Um, the anxiety of trying to find a front page the next day, um, I would start worrying about tomorrow as soon as I'd finished today. And the that would keep me awake. And I was always worried, I, I was worried because I knew that inside I was falling to bits. The outside looked fine, but I knew that inside I was properly falling to bits. And I, I also know that within that culture, the, um, if you start to get a bit broken, they, you know, there is support there, um, but also you're viewed as a bit of damaged goods by your colleagues. And, and then they're like, well, we won't, we can't ask him to do too much, we can't. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to go down that, that road. So I was trying externally to put on this kind of shell. So every morning I'd get up and I'd put my shell on and I'd go to work. And, but I lived inside my shell. I hardly heard what was going on. Had I not had such a good team around me, my imposter syndrome would have been realized because there were plenty of times that I could have easily let the ball go. Um, and I, just couldn't understand a lot of what was going on anymore. I, I lost um, almost all sense of reality. Um, my, my life was literally in inside walls that were just the times and I lived for, for the light bit that went in when I went in to the light bit that where I came out and the gap in the middle got longer and longer and longer and longer. Um, and it was just suffocating. Um, and trying to explain it to people that you're you're not a hundred percent sure whether they've got your best interests at heart is hard. So you're constantly you're constantly on your guard, um, and and that whole fight or flight thing comes in. Um, so I was constantly awake. You know, I would go to sleep. I mean, and that's where the you know I would sit at home and drink easily drink a bottle of wine, maybe two bottles of wine a night when I get in, in the hope that it would put me to sleep. But of course, it puts you to sleep, but it's the wrong sort of sleep. And then you wake up and you feel lethargic. So then you're into coffee and sugar and all the rest of it. And, you know, those, those things, they become your, you know, your sort of your backbone, if you like. Um, and, and you, I don't know, it was just a, it was a, a spiral. It was like, um, it was just like a, like one of those fairground rides, like a helter skelter, but it never ended. It was just constantly, and you were just going down, and it was getting faster and faster, and all all the the noises and everything. It was like it was like sort of some kind of crazy thing. I couldn't. If somebody had said to me, "Just explain what you see now," I couldn't tell you what I see because half the time I couldn't actually physically see. I couldn't see what was really going on. It was just a blur of color and shape and and the noise was incredible um the noise in my head it was like a rushing wind it was like a mistune radio um you know it was awful in a nutshell it's really, really interesting in the sense that you couldn't see and yet one of the well-being tips which i'd like to talk about a yeah. little later which you shared with me is seeing yes so how did the transition work for you? When, what, what would you credit to, you know, what work did you, you have to do to be able to turn things around? I, I think it came from just being outside. Um, and um, I, um, I go to church quite a lot, um, but I don't go as, as often as I should, well, often as I could. Um, mainly because I, I go away leading workshops and I had a long chat with the minister at church and I, I said, look, you know, I don't come on a Sunday very often. He said, no, he said, but um, 
what, you know, where do you experience your faith? And I said, well, to be honest, I actually experience it when I'm standing on a beach or, you know, surrounded by the mountains. I, I can appreciate what God has put together. And he said, well, if you spend a little bit of time there, then make that your church. Um, and I thought, well, actually, there's something in that because church isn't a building. Church is a group of people that come together to express their faith. Well, if I can express it in the landscape. So I stopped going out to take pictures and I started going out to just spend time. Because um, if you say to somebody, I'm going to go and take pictures, they go, what of? Well, actually, I didn't know what I was going to experience. I didn't know what I was going to see. Um, so I would just say, right, I'm going to go and spend time. And that time is the thing that I'd been missing. It was that little bit of personal space that you can go and say, right, this is just for me. And whether it's a bubble bath with a glass of wine and candles, or whether it's walking over the hills, time in yourself is a, is a great thing. But it was in spending time standing on beaches, just looking at things, and then seeing things that I started to sort of get a, a feel for it. But I was still going through ups and downs of depression and it was actually um, it was actually at home um, where I really started to see um, I, I shot a series of pictures called Fragile Beauty which are a series of flowers which um, I would have on my windowsill and I would just watch them and then one day I started to notice that the way the flowers looked matched how I felt and I thought, that's a bit weird. And I thought, oh, you're just imagining it. And then I started looking closer. And I realized that in looking and then seeing deeper, you could see, it, you can almost see a reflection of, of yourself, um, which sounds really weird when you say it out loud. And I didn't share the pictures with anybody for ages because I thought people just think you're mad or it's all pretentious art stuff. Um, but they were very, very key to me. So whenever I felt really bad, I would just wander around and either find flowers by the roadside um, or go to different florists just looking at flowers, just standing and looking at them mm. until I saw something that matched the way, the way I sort of mm. felt. Um, and that really sort of triggered the, the seeing and it was mm. Mm. it was a case of if I if I go somewhere and I step back from the, the the actual process of the photography but just stay in a place look at a place absorb what that place is saying and then really start to look at how I'm feeling about the place there's that two-way communication and then you start to see different little subtleties um, and I mean, one of the things that photographers say most of all is, oh, the light's wrong. Mm -hmm. To me, the light's never wrong. The light is the light. You know, you, you're given the light on a day and you can make something of it or you can not. It's not wrong light. It's, it's mm -hmm. just accept what's there and roll with it a little bit. And then you might find something completely unexpected will come around the corner and and, and give you something that's worth so much more to you as a person than a perfect, you know, view with a perfectly lit kind of cloud and a nice mountain and all the rest of it. Yes, that's a lovely photo. But if you've got something that really resonates with you, that really connects your emotions at that particular point with that particular place, it's going to stay with you forever in a much more powerful way and even if you don't take a picture you'll have it up here and mm. in here mm. Mm. so the the photography is kind of an it's sort of a a way of me recording my feelings if you yeah, like so for me this it, it's it's seeming like a sort of a recorded enhanced mindfulness so it's yeah. kind of yeah being aware and very present and yeah. but also engaged and a two-way process yes yeah and i think it has to be a two-way process because mm. um you know, people say, oh, you take a picture. 
I don't think you do take a picture. I think you're given pictures. Um, and a landscape will only give you a picture when it's ready to give it to you. You know, you can't go and take, it's not a smash and grab raid on a jeweler's. Um, you know, I know photographers who turn up and they, they arrive in the car and their bags are kit and they get out and go and in the car and they, they're gone. And then I know photographers who will spend a lot of time in a place and maybe take one frame. But for them, the experience is much deeper. And it's that deeper experience that comes through seeing and experiencing that is more important, I think. So for you, seeing, experiencing and photographing yeah. are like they are your they're you yeah. know, they're therapeutic for you. They are now, yeah, yeah, definitely. And in terms of the therapists that you've seen in your experiences yeah. of finding and being in therapy, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, yeah, I think with a therapist, it, it's very hard because you make a decision on the person, um, usually based on maybe an internet profile or a recommendation. But when you sit down opposite them, I think you make a decision on whether you're going to tell them the truth within the first couple of seconds. Um, and I, I have definitely lied to um, therapists because I don't like them. Um, or there's something about them that just doesn't sit comfortably. Certainly ones that were found through work, I kept at a definite distance. Um, because although they say it's confidential, I, I had grave doubts. Um, and I'm sure, you know, that they were confidential, but there's something about that, you know, the office finds you a counsellor, is the counsellor then feeding back? Um, I know it's unethical, um, but that trust thing is key and you have to be able to feel, you know, at ease. Um, and when I didn't, I, but weirdly, I, I, I went along with it. Mm -hmm. For how long? Um, one of them for nearly a year, which is a, you know, okay, some of it was paid for by work, but then I'm paying for it myself. And I'm thinking, why on earth are you going? Why, what are you doing this? And then I realized it was because I didn't want to hurt her feelings. I was like, this is mad. I don't care about her, you know, but I didn't want to hurt, I didn't want her upset. I didn't want her to think she was a bad counselor, which she probably isn't with another person, but for me, she didn't work. Um, you know, uh, the counsellor that helped me discover the sort of therapy through photography was amazing. Um, you know, I mean, I didn't tell, I liked her and we had a good relationship, but it was very much, there, there was like a distance between us that I never went into. I never filled the space that allowed her to sort of explore more. I was very guarded until she said to me, talk to me about this picture. And then I didn't f sort of go into the space, I filled the space. And she said, yeah, that's the first time you've ever told me the truth. And did you bring, were you referencing the picture in, in conversation and? Yeah, she was asking me um, about a particular picture that I'd taken, which was like a single stick in the, uh, in the sea. And I'd photographed it um, using a long exposure technique. So the sea goes really flat and calm. And she said, just explain it to me. And I said, well, I don't know, it was a stick in the sea. I said, but when I look at it now, I said, I guess it's a little bit kind of autobiographical in a way. I said, because that stick looks like I feel. Um, and she said, you know, why is there all the space around it? Why isn't it just the stick? And I said, because that's all the kind of space I want. I want space, I don't have any space. I said, so it's kind of a wishful thinking thing. But I didn't consciously, when I took the picture, think about all of that, um, which is why when I started talking about it, I was surprised that all this stuff just came out. <laughs> I mean, it was like taking the lid off something. Um, and then when I went out to take more pictures, I, I suddenly, it was like, um, it was like a, a, a little light came on. I suddenly realized that the way I was photographing was so different to other people that it was, it was all very self-expression, you know, it was all, in, in a sense, all about me. Um, and then I realized by looking back at the pictures and, and keeping little notes about what I'd thought, what I'd felt, what I'd seen, what I'd smelt, you know, if I'd touched something, that it was all going 
it was all going in to make that moment. Uh, and how did you come to, to writing things down? What, where did that idea come from? Um, I've always written um, little notes, usually very random um, and sketched as well. So I used to keep a sketchbook um, which would have drawings of the places that I was photographing with little notes about them. Um, but a couple of years ago that got, uh, got stolen when my car got broken into. And since then I've kept little, just little journals. Um, sometimes in a very kind of random way, sometimes in a bit more structured way. Um, but each year I try and make a sort of a start on, on one. And I find that by writing things down removes them from me. I, I'm a great storyteller, so if something's not going quite as I want it, so in my head it goes right, it's not going like you want it to because of you've done this and you've done this and you've done this and gradually it winds me up into a, a state. And just by writing it down, I can then step back from it and say, okay, so that hasn't worked because of that. That's fine. That's not my fault. There was nothing you could do about that. Um, that's another person's problem offloaded onto you. You don't need that, you know. It, and it, it's just looking at the way I feel about things. So some days it's very short, some days it's a bit longer. Um, I don't do so many drawings now, but I, I have a little Polaroid type printer in my bag that if I see something, I, I take a picture on my phone or with my camera and then I just print it out and I stick it in my book. Um, and I, it's quite a nice thing to do. So during the day, I'll make little notes in it. And then in the evening, I'll just sit down and go over the notes and just make a few other notes. And so you've acquired quite an, a large number of self-help tools in, in a way. So were some <laughs> of them discovered with, it, with your therapists? Um, yeah, I think, you know, if I'm honest, all of them have been taken from bits of advice that therapists have given me. Um, because I think for me, I couldn't have done it without the therapy, even the ones I've not really gotten on with. Um, I think you take a little bit from, from everybody um, and you apply what works. So a couple of my therapists have said, you know, write, do gratefulness journals, things like that. And I, I've done that one, you know, I, I had one who was all for drawing and sketching um, another one was for making things out of Lego when Noah was little. So I would often sit and build things out of Lego. Um, I mean, but what can you do with things out? I mean, I, I liked my Lego to be perfect. <laughs> so that became an issue in itself. Um, but you gradually, I think you sort of, I think as you, as you start on your, your kind of, your recovery path, I think you start to understand what works as you begin to understand your triggers um, and as you understand what works for you you can start to put it into practice and it, I think it also depends on whether you want to actually get through it as well um, because it's very I got very comfortable in my depression at one point um, and started at, to let it define me you know it's oh here's Paul he has depression you know it's like yeah, I'm poor, I have depression. It's a bit like I used to be, I used to let the job at the Times define me. Hello, I'm Paul, pitch writer of the Times. Um, and when your friends introduce you to their parents on their wedding day, as this is Paul, not my best friend of 10 years, but he's Paul, pitch writer of the Times, you think, hmm, there's something a bit pear-shaped there. Um, so I try not to let things define me. I hate now being put in a box that says you only do this type of photography, you only do that type of photography. I mean, we all do put ourselves in little boxes. But I, I think trying to take a little bit from everybody that I've had experience with and apply that in a way that works for me, um, works I, I want to be without depression. Um, I think it will always be part of my life. Um, but... I am managing it quite well at the moment. Um, and that's down to all of those different inputs. Um, and gradually I've sort of pulled it together and gone, okay, this is starting to work. And I can feel myself moving forward. I mean, from where I am today to where I was two years ago is incredible. 
And if I look back and then, you know, I mean, it was five years ago last week that I tried to kill myself. And that, you know, if I think where I am now, five years ago, I wouldn't have sat here talking to you. You know, you may have been sat next to me at Beachy Head. Right? <laughs> but it, it's a wanting to get better. Um, I don't want to be constantly under that black cloud, you know, being pursued by that noise and um, the chaos in my head. I, I want to be still, I want to be calm, um, and I want to have a quality of life that being like that didn't give me. So. And you've definitely found your own unique avenues um, th through that. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you would be able to share with us some of the, some of the prints that have helped you navigate out of it. Yeah, of course, I've got a few, a few here. So um, the, these are some of the, the flowers from the, the Fragile Beauty series. So these were the first ones that I took. Um, and they're just daisies. There's nothing fancy. They're not in a studio or anything, um, or anything like that. They're um, they're just took again, taken against my kitchen window. Um, and all I've done is put some tracing paper against the window to stop the sunlight coming through, and then just just photograph them in front of that. Um, and I just I just love the way they wilt because they just look so tired. And that's where I was at the time. Um, and and I thought, oh, that was the first thing that resonated with me about them. And other people might look at it and go, no, but that's irrelevant. Um, and if you, this one in particular, I, you know, I look at this little fella here and they're kind of, oh my goodness, no more. You know, that sort of anxiety that is in there, the sort of the stress, it just, the, it just sort of picked up something for me. And it, it's looking and then seeing that and connecting is the thing that works for me. Um, other people would probably think I'm mad, but weirdly, more people have bought the Fragile Beauty series. So I, I exhibited them a while ago because somebody said to me, you really should get them out there. And when I did, I couldn't believe that people bought them because they were so personal to me and I'd hid them away that it, it, it was such a shock. And when people said, why did you take them like that? And you, I started explaining, people connected with the story and a lot, of, uh, a lot of people who bought them understood the battle and then looked at them and said, actually, I can see, I can see that, um, you know, and when other people come to you and say, I understand, I'm going through, my partner's going through, my brother, my mother, all of a sudden you realise you're not alone in it. Um, and there's such a, I mean, not so bad now, but there was such a sort of stigma in discussing mental illness with anybody. Um, you know, I mean, people would say, oh, you know, what you, what's wrong? You know, why are you so unhappy? It's not an unhappiness. You know, it's something deeper. And when you start to show it in pictures, it was much easier to explain the kind of the weary kind of exhaustion. Um, and then with the sort of the landscape ones, um, you know, it's, it's just about the space. I like a little static object that, and, you know, weirdly this is a lifeboat station. Um, but I don't do any kind of, Photoshop or stuff, it's all done in camera and it's all with weather and normally bad weather. I spend a lot of time outside in the rain. Um, so this is on a kind of rainy, misty morning um, because rain obscures a lot of clutter, mist, fog, and that's really nice to play with. Um, it's also quite ethereal, it's quite romantic, you know, it brings out a lot of wonderful things. So, but I, I like the solitude of this, but the fact that it's joined to the edge so it's not all is not lost kind of thing but when you say when you start talking about things like that and it comes out loud it always sounds a bit you know like I should be sticking in for the Turner Prize or something whereas when I look at it in my and I'm talking about it to myself it's a very different you know it sounds kind of real it sounds more real um, 
you know, this is one of the series of broken sticks that I was doing. It, the first one I did I had just one of these, um, but you know, just in the in the sea, we've got all these little sticks, and the fact they're all kind of broken, and some are together and some are not. But you've got that infinite space behind, uh, which again is caused. That's just a sea fog, um, and there's no sort of genius to the pictures. I, I find it extremely serene and ethereal, as you yeah. were saying. Um, but it's to reflect the peace and the sort of tranquility and the space that I wanted, that I wasn't getting. And it seemed odd to me that I would photograph what I wasn't getting, you know, um, again with that one, I'll put it the right way up. Um, you know, it's just in the Lake District at dawn. Um, you know, but I just love the, this little tree, but this new dawn coming over. Um, you know, there's such a sort of meditative space in there that, you know, when you stand and take pictures like that, you, you can't help but calm down. I think it um, is very meditative. Um, and the participants who, who, who sign up to your courses, yes. are, they look, are they drawn to s similar yeah. states of mind? And um, Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because I do a lot of talks to photographic societies and camera clubs where I talk openly about what's happened to me since leaving the Times. And then I get a lot of people come on one-to-ones or small, very small groups who come to me personally and say, we'd like to learn to see like that. Some of them, what they mean is, I want to take pictures like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas others mean, I want to understand how I can express myself. And it's mm -hmm. deciphering the difference. Um, but a lot of them want to take a step back um, and the first, the first thing I, I say to them is, well, if you're, if you want to take pictures like that, then just take pictures of the things that please you. You know, um, I sometimes do a little exercise, or exercise with myself. Although I photograph mostly in black and white, when I use my phone, I don't. So I'll often close my eyes and think of a colour. Um, whatever colour comes into my head, or whatever, you know, when you close your eyes, sometimes you can see colour. So whatever colour I see or, or think of, I then go out and I just take pictures of that colour. Mm. And that teaches you to see. Because on your way to work, on your way to the shops, you might be going to work and to the shop, but you won't look around you. But if you're going there, but you know that you've got to see turquoise because that was the colour that came into your head or came in, all of a sudden you're like, wow, I didn't notice that, I didn't see this. And it makes that little bit of time from leaving the house to wherever you're going a personal space. And it, I find that gives me an enormous amount of joy and happiness. And happiness, I think, is something that's very personal. Mm -hmm. But if you start to build in happiness into your life, actually, your life is really fulfilling. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you don't have to have loads of stuff. If you can be happy with what you've got, um, then all of a sudden your quality of life improves because you appreciate and you're grateful for what you have. Um, and gratitude is a, an amazing thing. You know, every time I've stood in a landscape looking at, you know, some of these things, like this place here, this is up in Romania in the mountains, I stood there just looking at that and I was so grateful that I was the only person there you know, how often do you want to go into a snowfield and just run around and make snow angels as a kid? All the time. You know, that was just, it was just bliss. Um, but to photograph it in such a way that, you know, there's, there's not a lot there. And it's not rocket science how you do it. All cameras and phones can do that. You know, it's not, it's not a dark art anymore. Um, it's just finding something that connects with you. Um, so close your eyes and think of a colour. <laughs> well, I'm so grateful to you for sharing with us all that you've been through, your experiences and ways that you've come around it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so, so moved by your work and inclined to want to look more and see more. Um, do you have any parting comments for anyone who's watching who can identify with what you've experienced and who at this point in time isn't feeling as uh, in, in, in a way that they're coping as, as, as you are? Um... I would say it's one step at a time and baby steps. 
on my worst days, I would congratulate myself for breathing in and out. Um, and, but it's concentrating on the breathing in and out um, and being aware that you're breathing in and out. And then if you are breathing in and out, then you're living. Um, and if you're living, then you're moving forward. And forward is where recovery is. Um, but actually, if you are well enough to get out, if you feel that you're strong enough to go outside, just go out and look. Go to a park. Just go and look at what is there. And if you go every day, you'll see the changes as, as spring comes in, as spring turns to summer, as summer turns to autumn. Um, you know, different times of day, the way the light hits trees, the way the light reflects through things. Even if you're in a city, you can do, you can be walking somewhere and just paying attention to the way light bounces off the glass buildings. It's beautiful, the contrast between the buildings. Most people don't look up because we always look at our phones, you know. Use your phone to take pictures, maybe ignore your emails for a bit yeah. <laughs> if you're still working. Yeah. That's a great tip for the modern age. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Harleytherapy.com is here to help you book counseling with therapists online or in person at times and prices that suit you wherever you are in the world. If this is your first listen to Therapy Lab, do hit subscribe to keep up to date with new episodes. If you feel you'd benefit from therapy and want to transform your life, visit harleytherapy.com to find a therapist anywhere in the UK and worldwide via Skype. We'll see you next time. We are joined by Paul Sanders, former picture... <laughs> <laughs> That's so got to make the woofers. Picture editor, former picture editor.